reveal some common misconceptions, misunderstandings, um, and also myths about Montessori and go through and kind of demystify them together, unravel the pieces together and see what the truth really is underlying some of those misunderstandings. We'll have some time at the end of the presentation for questions. I know a lot of you uh, certainly have questions as we go through, so please hold on to those. Feel free to pop them in the chat uh, and we will address them at the end. Before we jump in, for anyone who's new, I do want to just take a few moments to share some information about myself as the host and the creator of the presentation. So my name is Heather White. I'm a former Montessori classroom teacher, administrator, and in-home caregiver with 15 years of experience in the world of Montessori. Currently, I work as an educational consultant, an instructional guide for adult learners who are working to receive their Montessori certification through the Center for Guided Montessori Studies. And I'm also a blog writer and content creator for several different organizations, including the American Montessori Society, Guiding Grow, and Mirrors Toys. I hold certifications from the American Montessori Society at the three to six and six to nine age groups. I've also taught with children ages nine to 12, so fourth through sixth grade here in the United States. I have a master's in education with a concentration in Montessori studies and an education specialist degree in school psychology. And I'm also a nationally certified school psychologist. So I want to pause for just a moment before we reveal some of these myths and just see if there are any things, um, and I know a lot of you have a little bit of an inside peek, right, from the, the previous sessions for those of you who joined me, but what are some things you've heard or think are true about Montessori? And I'm just curious to see if some of those are things you've learned that are evident truths about Montessori and what of those might be myths or misconceptions. So feel free to use the raise hand feature um, and share or add your comments in the chat. Uh, personally, Ms. Uh, White, uh, I've never uh, dealt directly with the uh, Montessori model, but I've heard that it is a system designed for children. So I don't know mm -hmm. if that is among the myths that we want to bo uh, bust today. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, it, it was a pedagogy that was developed for children. Uh, interestingly, today it has been used um, it's even being used a lot right now with the elderly community um, in aging care facilities around the world. And, and some of these practical life experiences and opportunities have been found to be really helpful. So Dr. Montessori did develop it for children. Um, and she did talk about uh, practices and uh, philosophies of how that could be enriched for children of all ages through adolescence. Uh, but absolutely, it holds power for other age groups as well. Thank you for that. Any other uh, ideas or um, thoughts that you have about what Montessori is? See, we have a couple more people just joining us. So give you just a second to think about that. And maybe it's just something you wanna think about or, or jot down um, next to you and just kind of uh, uh, reflect and see if it's something that we go over throughout the presentation today. All right, let's go ahead and move forward. If anyone does have an idea about Montessori, something you've heard or something you believe that you wanna share uh, as we move forward, please feel free to raise your hand uh, in the raise hand feature or add it into the chat. So a very common misconception about Montessori is that it's not based on scientific research, that it was just an idea that Dr. Montessori had that she developed on her own without any scientific basis. I do see a, a note here in the chat. Montessori came, the, the Montessori method came from a lady in Italy. Absolutely, Dr. Montessori was an educator, a physician from Italy. So as far as Montessori not being based or grounded in scientific research, the Montessori method actually has its foundation 
in observation and the experiences that Dr. Maria Montessori had. Like I said, it was a beautiful segue. She was a physician and an educator. And since the life of Maria Montessori, different changes, uh, modern changes have been applied to more traditional teaching practices with the introduction of new technologies, the expansion of the cultural curriculum. So over the years, Dr. Montessori's initial approach has been studied and has been validated by this growing body of scientific research that confirms the effectiveness of the original method that she developed. In fact, in the book I have shown here uh, by Dr. Angeline S. Lillard, it's entitled Montessori, the Science Behind the Genius, it's revealed that current scientific research actually proves that there is astonishing support for Montessori's major insights. And there have also recently been uh, quite a few research studies. There was one in Time Magazine uh, about the effectiveness of Montessori, both for children in the moment and long term. I see uh, two notes here in chat. It's related to activities. Okay, yep, Montessori involves hands-on activities. Uh, is it practical used in classes? Uh, I think that relates to the myth that we just debunked, right? That, that it is practical. It has this wonderful application that is absolutely backed by scientific research that proves its effectiveness. Another popular misconception or misunderstanding about Montessori is that it's expensive and it's only for the wealthy. While I do want to note that Montessori schools can sometimes be more costly than traditional public schools, the Montessori approach has been adapted in schools that service communities from a large range of socioeconomic backgrounds. In fact, the Montessori method actually has its roots as a full day childcare system for members of a poor inner city and in a district of Rome. Uh, so Dr. Montessori herself started this methodology with children from a lower socioeconomic background. The misconception that Montessori schools are only for upper class wealthy families likely comes from the stigma that was established during the mid 20th century when the American Montessori movement began as it was led by a lot of private preschools that were funded by tuition. So people started to connect this idea of a private tuition-based program with Montessori as it sp spread across the Americas. Today, however, the Montessori pedagogy has been implemented in various settings, public schools, charter schools, private schools, and even in homeschool environments across the world. Montessori education is actually available in almost 600 public schools, including district schools, magnets, charters around the world. A lot of private Montessori schools, although tuition-based and perhaps unattainable for some families financially, do offer scholarships. They have co-ops, and some states even provide childcare credits or assistance to families from low, lower income backgrounds, making Montessori education more accessible. And I think it's really important to note that Montessorians around the world uh, are having this conversation and are continuing to search for ways to make Montessori more accessible to everyone, because that really is our goal and our dream to continue what Dr. Montessori started and allow this incredible philosophy and pedagogy to be accessed worldwide. I also want to make a note on this topic that although Montessorians do practice um, exclusivity in the sense that we are only implementing the Montessori method in the schools, right? Which can make it seem a little bit uh, uh, like a click, if you will, which we'll get to in a bit. Many Montessori educators do have this intense desire to serve the child and spread that knowledge of the Montessori method, like I was just describing. A lot of Montessori communities are very tight knit, but they're not elitist. Um, in fact, this is an area that the American Montessori Society, AMS, and a lot of its member schools are continuing to develop. There are groups like the anti-bias, anti-racist uh, group 
that has implemented requirements for schools. There's a newly uh, released equity tool that AMS developed to help support schools in becoming more inclusive uh, and visiting local Montessori schools and asking questions about the practices and the philosophy as a whole should help to debunk this myth even further as you reveal how welcoming and accepting the Montessori community truly is. Let's see, I see a couple more notes here in chat. I've seen a lot of so-called Montessori products, which are basically things that kids can use independently, like a low and smaller bed, <laughs> meant to help a toddler be able to remove and adjust the sheets. I wonder, is this a real Montessori concept or is it just marketing abusing the name? That is a really, really great one. We are gonna to get to that here in just a few minutes. Uh, here in developing countries, I don't know if it will be used as it needs a lot of learning before teaching, but how I wish we could use it, it's enriched with good teaching methodologies. And then the children depend on themselves. We'll talk about that, right? That level of independence. And I think there's a great point there, right? That Montessori does a, a require a lot of teaching, uh, a lot of learning, excuse me, before teaching from the guides, from parents, from educators, from caregivers. Um, I think what's nice about Montessori is that the name isn't, and this presents, presents some challenges as well. The name is not trademarked. So anyone can adopt the Montessori philosophy and pedagogy and embrace it without necessarily uh, having the training, official certification, uh, without the accreditation of the school itself by an accrediting body like the American Montessori Society or the International Montessori Council. Um, but there are tons of ways that you can continue to learn and undergo that intellectual preparation that Dr. Montessori talked about to try to include elements of the philosophy and pedagogy without needing this expensive uh, or in-depth training. Many people also falsely believe that Montessori is just for the preschool age child. Although Montessori schools around the world are preschools, the method itself is designed for children from birth to the age of 18. Uh, in fact, Montessori shared quite a bit of knowledge about teaching elementary age students and adolescents. She had a book entitled From Childhood to Adolescence that analyzed the characteristics and the needs of children ages seven to 12, and then also described what she felt was the ideal setting of this farm school uh, that she called Erdkinder, E-R-D-K-I-N-D-E-R, Erdkinder. It was a farm school for adolescents that she really felt needed to be incorporated into both private and public Montessori programs, as this was really the type of community and productive, meaningful uh, work that children this age were searching for. She really envisioned that this space, this Erdkinder, uh, would be a place that adolescents would live and work together. She talked about them developing ways to care for themselves, to care for their community, to care for the land. She felt like the farm yielded uh, animal and plant products that the children or the adolescents could sustain to help them learn how to sustain their community, how they could take surplus goods then and sell them to surrounding areas. Um, and that adolescents would then be able to develop and manage this business, if you will, where they could establish economic independence as well. In more urban settings uh, in the modern world, uh, we have taken this idea and adolescents are given opportunities to run small businesses, maybe a bookshop, or a coffee shop, but the same principle of how to care for themselves, give back to their community, um, and find their place in the world, if you will, still exist. Many people also believe that Montessori is just for gifted kids or highly intellectual children. To outside observers, Montessori students seem very advanced for their age, because they've been practicing academic and practical skills, receiving scaffolded learning experiences really since the age of three. And in some schools that have an infant and toddler program, maybe even before that. Um, and this might lead to this incorrect assumption 
that Montessori then is just for gifted children. But in reality, Montessori schools help children to discover their unique talents and potentials, which promotes what we like to call the giftedness in all students, right? We're helping children find their gift, find their talent, find their potential, and we're fostering and leaning into and fostering that. Interestingly, there's kind of the, the flip side of the coin here. Another misconception is that Montessori is only for neurodivergent children and gifted children do fall into that category, but we're thinking about children here as well that might have some learning challenges. Maybe they have uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, maybe they're autistic, um, maybe they have dyslexia or dysgraphia. So this myth uh, might be rooted in the fact that Maria Montessori began her work with children who had disabilities. And so a lot of people start to think that that's still what the philosophy and pedagogy remains today. Although there are Montessori schools and programs that are designed specifically for students with exceptionalities, neurodivergent students are welcomed and included in Montessori classrooms globally. Uh, while the method is highly effective with these children with learning differences, the method itself was actually designed to ensure success for all. So yes, there are environments that are particularly built uh, and designed for neurodivergent students, but on the whole, the method itself and most of the classrooms and schools around the world are for children of all learning styles and all learning backgrounds, all types of neurodivergences. Another uh, common myth is that Montessori schools are religious. While it's true that some private Montessori schools do incorporate an element of religious education in the classroom, and Maria Montessori herself was a devout Catholic, Montessori is not a religiously affiliated uh, methodology in and, its, in and of itself. It is true that some of the first Montessori programs were sponsored by Catholics or other religious organizations, but Montessori education as a whole is secular and is based on that scientific observation and evidence that we talked about originally in the presentation. So students from and families from all types of religious backgrounds are welcomed into Montessori schools around the world where diversity is embraced and encouraged. This is one uh, that often makes me laugh. It's the idea that there is so much freedom, there's no structure at all, that children just run around and do whatever they want. <laughs> so when looking at a Montessori classroom, you might see 25 or more children involved in these individual or small group activities rather than one large group activity that everyone is participating in at once. So. It's possible in a Montessori classroom that every single child is doing something different. At first glance, then, uh, this might seem really chaotic, leading people to believe that children just run around and do whatever they want. However, if you take the time to really sit back and observe following the activities of, let's say, two or three children over the course of what we call the three-hour work cycle, you would see that there are these series of self-directed activities that they're engaged in, this really purposeful, meaningful work. The children aren't just running through the classroom. They're each engaged and involved in the, these self-selected works that are designed to build the sense of concentration and to support their independent learning. Choosing what you do is not the same as doing whatever you want. Uh, a well-known anecdote about Montessori students doing what they like comes from uh, author E.M. Standing's book that's entitled uh, Maria Montessori, Her Life and Work. And she says, a rather captious and skeptical visitor to a Montessori class once buttonholed one of the children, a little girl of seven, and asked, is it true that in this school you are allowed to do anything you like? She replied, I don't know about that but I do know that we like what we do. 
So it's this idea that you're allowing children to explore things that they're interested in, to dive deeply into these topics that fascinate them. And there is this freedom of movement, right? They are moving about the classroom, but only when it's needed. Maybe it's to put one work away and to get another. Maybe it's to get a drink of water, to fix themselves snack, to use the restroom. So all of their movements, all of their activities are purposeful and meaningful, but it does create a bit more activity in the classroom than what we typically see. And to an outsider that might appear uh, that children are just wandering around doing whatever they please. Interestingly, the flip side of that, which I'm not sure how we can have both of these myths uh, be held at, at the same time, but other people believe that Montessori classrooms are too structured. They're too strict. Uh, parents sometimes see what we refer to in Montessori as work as the child's play as really being too structured or too strict. So the activities in the classroom that are set up are referred to as work and the children are directed to choose their work. That's the language that we use in a Montessori classroom. However, the work that the children is, are doing is very satisfying to them and they make no distinction between work and play. Uh, children are almost always finding Montessori activities to be both interesting and fun. Montessori classrooms do have this inherent structure and order within them, but that's only one part of the approach. Teachers give lessons to carefully illustrate the intended purpose of each material in the classroom. They demonstrate how to do the work step-by-step step in a very methodical manner. But students are given freedoms. They're given the freedom to choose what work they want to do, when they want to do that work, with whom they want to do the work, uh, and what they want to, to engage in on each different day. And while the guide, the teacher, then their responsibility is to step back, to observe, to take note, and ensure that concepts are practiced to allow the child to uh, develop skills and to master them. Montessori education really promotes following the child, which is a practice that focuses on meeting each child's individual needs and providing them opportunities to freely explore their own interests. So what in Montessori, we call it freedom within limits, right? We're giving the child these freedoms to choose, to move, but it's within limits. We've set the limit of as the guide or the teacher of what uh, boundaries or um, structure exists within the classroom. Again, kind of contradictory to that. <laughs> Some people believe Montessori is too unstructured, um, almost believing that it lacks structure altogether. Like I was just saying, the Montessori classroom is structured, but that structure is quite different from a traditional preschool or traditional classroom setting which appears to others as not being structured because it's different from what they're used to. Montessori, uh, Dr. Montessori observed that children naturally tend to use self-selected purposeful activities to help develop themselves as human beings. The Montessori classroom has these prepared activities, these trained adults that develop this sense of structure that's intended to promote this natural process of human development that Dr. Montessori said uh, takes place. Students who are new to a Montessori classroom, who may or may not have been in a traditionally structured school, learn to select their own work and complete those tasks with order, concentration, and attention to detail. Montessorians refer to children who work in this independent, self-disciplined self way as normalized. That's the, the, the term that we use in Montessori. And this means that they're using uh, natural and normal tendencies of human development to engage in this focused, concentrated, self-fulfilling work. Others believe that Montessori schools don't allow opportunities for play, right? Everything the child is doing is work. So when do they get a chance to play? Like I was saying, Montessori in Montessori, we refer to the child's activities as work. Children refer to what they're doing, those activities that are on the shelf as their work. 
when a three-year-old comes home and tells their parent or caregiver uh, the, about the work they did today, it often sounds a little too serious for a child that you just picked up from preschool, right? Uh, a little uh, funny caveat here that I think is cute to share in this instance. I heard the other day that there was a, a young child who came home from school and said, mom, um, I worked with my colleagues in the class today. This is a three-year-old. I worked with my colleagues in class today. And the mom said, colleagues, do you mean friends? And she said, no, mom, at school we do work. And so they're my colleagues, not my friends. And I just thought that was so cute. Um, it really goes to show how children, even very young children, internalize this idea that Dr. Montessori talked about, that work is play. Um, so what we tend to forget as adults is that children really have this deep desire to contribute meaningfully to the world around them. They seek purposeful activities. And we sometimes deny them that opportunity when we regard everything they're doing as just play, right? With our eyes, we start to observe the child's joyful work and expressions of deep satisfaction when they're engaged in what Dr. Montessori called work as play. In fact, Dr. Maria Montessori revealed children ages three to six don't really distinguish between work and play at all. For them, their work in the classroom is play. Uh, in fact, when she was speaking with parents, she once said, you will be surprised when I tell you that the greater part of what you call play is really work. So I want you to take just a moment and consider this. You start a new job. You arrive on the first day full of enthusiasm. You're ready to uh, contribute to the success of your work group. You're excited to be there. You're met at the door by your new boss and you're told, go outside and play. We'll let you know when it's time to go to lunch and then go home. Ooh, that, that feels a little, uh, a little insulting, right? You are ready to show up and do some work. But that's exactly what we're doing to children when we dismiss their desires to contribute to their own well-being and to the common good of their classroom environment or their home environment. So Montessori schools then create environments where children enjoy working on activities that provide them grace and dignity. Montessori children often describe feelings of satisfaction and exhilaration even when they complete these tasks that we might have considered play. Some people also falsely believe uh, just that Montessori uh, doesn't allow for play, that Montessori education doesn't allow for creativity. Um, some people think that Montessori is against fantasy, which therefore stifles a child's creativity. Dr. Maria Montessori actually recognized that a child's ability to implore their imagination was indeed a sign of this special mental ability of higher order that she identified. But she also realized through her careful observations that children under the age of six are so mesmerized by the world around them, by the real world. They're captivated by what they hear, what they see, what they touch, what they taste. And that that's what we really need to hone in on for these very young children. To capitalize on what she called this absorbent mind, soaking up everything around them, for children in the first plane of development, those years of zero to six, Maria Montessori emphasized the need to provide these children with practical experiences that really fulfill these inner needs that they have, but also allow them to better understand the world around them that they're so mesmerized by. For example, um, she found that children would much rather chop up a real fruit that they could enjoy for a snack, right? They're getting this rich sensorial experience, this practical application or practical activity of chopping something and washing a fruit that they then get to enjoy and to eat rather than playing with or pretending to cut wooden fruit with a wooden knife. Uh, the freedom within limits that we kind of mentioned earlier encourage this natural balance between providing these practical experiences and allowing opportunities for children to engage in creative problem solving. That in, and instead of this happening through fantasy play, right, that we're kind of helping the child 
uh, create on their own, whether that's through some kind of exposure from us, maybe a book, a story we've told them, some kind of TV show they've watched, right? Instead of this creative problem solving that exists in this fantasy world, they're engaging in this creative problem solving in things that have real world application that are meaningful and purposeful for them. So their creativity just looks a little different. It's important to note that art and music are also a really integral part of the Montessori classroom, giving children even more opportunities to express themselves creatively. The Montessori bells are a really integral part of the early childhood classroom for children ages three to six, which allow children to start to learn how to hear and play music sensorily. In lieu of more traditional methods of recording work, Montessori students are actually encouraged to express their knowledge that they've acquired through creative mediums. So maybe instead of uh, completing a worksheet, right, they learn about volcanoes and then they build a model and they label pieces, the parts of the volcano on the model. Or maybe they draw a flower and then label its parts. So creativity really abounds in a Montessori environment. In fact, a recent study revealed that Montessori students actually demonstrate higher levels of creativity than their peers without a Montessori educational background. Many people uh, believe that Montessori materials and activities all have to be wooden and neutral in color. The misconception that all materials have to be wooden, uh, we think stems from the fact that Dr. Maria Montessori advocated for the use of natural materials to offer children these really rich sensorial experiences through varied weights and textures. She recommended using materials like glass, ceramic, silk, metal, and wood so that the child could feel and see the differences in the weights and textures of these materials instead of just everything being feeling and looking uh, the same, much like you might see if uh, all the materials in a classroom were plastic, right? Or rubber maybe even. Dr. Montessori also advocated that the materials in a Montessori environment should have this aesthetic of beauty. She talked about creating spaces that were calm and inviting so that the child wouldn't be overstimulated or overwhelmed. She described how this might be neutral wooden shelving and baskets or boxes made of natural materials, but she never stated that every single thing in a Montessori environment, every single material needed to be wooden or neutral. In terms of the materials themselves, in fact, uh, color is encouraged to be utilized because it adds another rich sensorial element for the children to explore. For instance, uh, a really, really uh, popular Montessori material for the three to six-year-old classroom for early childhood is called the Pink Tower, and it's pink for this specific purpose. Maria Montessori carefully observed and found that children were more drawn to this material when it was pink versus when it was another color. The same is true for a popular Montessori material known as the geometric solids, um, which are blue. They're actually shown here on the screen. And they're blue because Dr. Montessori found children had this greater sense of visual appeal. They were more drawn to utilize this material and to explore it when it was blue versus when it was another color. We mentioned briefly this idea when we were talking about uh, Montessori just being for children um, from wealthy backgrounds, right? That there might be this elitist or uh, elitist ideology or this click mentality, right? Uh, that Montessorians are really this selective group. So I, I wanna start by saying, uh, sharing a definition of what a click is. A click is an exclusive circle of people with a common purpose. Many Montessori teachers could be accused of being this, right? Because they're of their intense desire to be of service to the life of a child coupled with the teacher's knowledge of child development. While many schools do have tight-knit communities though, they are not exclusive. They are very inclusive and welcoming. The enthusiasm and dedication that's evident in the work of Montessorians could be misinterpreted as excluding um, uninitiated newcomers, right? It, it might be viewed in that way. 
But my experience with Montessori teachers, administrators, caregivers, um, with individuals across the globe through my 15 years in the world of Montessori has been that they're really eager to share their knowledge with others. They're really eager to welcome others, to help you understand Montessori and to bring you into this wonderful world that we've discovered, this wonderful philosophy and pedagogy and share that with everyone. Um, so I encourage you to just ask instead of feeling uh, intimidated or as though you're not welcomed. Another common misconception is that Montessori students are ill-prepared for traditional education after Montessori. Many parents appreciate Montessori for young children, but avoid it because they have this misconception that their child will not be prepared for more traditional education after they leave Montessori. While the switch to a more traditional school setting would be something new and different for the child who has attended Montessori schools and might be a little scary at first, um, their educational foundation that they've received in Montessori will really, really well prepare them for the transition. Not only does the Montessori method promote academic learning, it also focuses on the development of the whole child. It's this holistic approach that fosters independence, problem solving, critical thinking, concentration, social skills, and this innate love of learning that really serves students well in any educational institution in the world beyond the classroom even. So in any setting that they go into, uh, research shows that Montessori students are prepared. Similarly, uh, we have this idea or this um, misconception, if you will, that Montessori doesn't prepare children for the real world. It's this little safe bubble that exists and, and they're not prepared for these real life experiences. Um, and this is perhaps one of the biggest concerns that parents have, right? Maria Montessori intentionally designed her pedagogy though as a preparation for the real world. In fact, she once said, the education of even a small child, therefore, does not aim at preparing him for school, but for life. The hallmark Montessori practice of multi-age groupings, um, if you were here several, several months ago, we, I had a, a class on multi-age groupings in Montessori. So it's based on Dr. Maria Montessori's planes of development. So children three to six are in a classroom together, children six to nine, so first, second, and third grade here in the States. Uh, then fourth, fifth, and sixth grade are together. And it's based on these planes of development that Dr. Montessori identified. And these multi-age groupings then create this diverse learning environment that more closely resembles real world communities because students are learning to interact with people of various ages. Uh, and going back to the, identi the uh, identity of Montessori of being inclusive, right? It's also helping children learn how to navigate and to work with and to communicate with others of various racial, cultural, and ethnic backgrounds as well. The level of independence, critical thinking, problem solving uh, that is supported by the Montessori approach to education really serves as an invaluable tool, this invaluable preparation for real world experiences. And I just wanted to um, share a little story here with you before we wrap up and I answer some questions. I had the, the privilege of working with a student. Uh, he went to the school where I worked for many, many years and he was in third grade when we started working together. I was uh, worked with him as his one-on-one -on -one tutor after school uh, and I worked with him as a tutor until he was in his sophomore year, his freshman year in college, he's now a junior in college uh, and in his undergrad program. And um, this specific child was very intelligent, um, had some, some social skill deficits. He was um, autistic, he had ADHD. He also had some processing challenges. Um, but just a, a wonderful child, so polite. Um, and so when he was getting ready to uh, write his uh, entrance letter for college, right? Um, he wanted to write it about 
how invaluable his time in a Montessori classroom was. So he was at our school until sixth grade, which was uh, the highest that we offered. And then he went on to another Montessori school for seventh and eighth grade. And then he went to a uh, more traditional private school that was not Montessori affiliated for high school. And so in this essay, he was really talking about how his Montessori background, his Montessori education from the ages of three through eighth grade really was so transformational for him and really allowed him to become who he was. And he wrote this uh, essay and he went to his advisor at his school who helped children with uh, their college insurance exams, with uh, filling out all of their paperwork. And his advisor told him, uh, recommended that he write something else because colleges were focused more on what had happened in high school than they were what had happened prior to that time. They were looking for things that were more recent. Um, and he was very adamant. He shared with me, with his mother, with the advisor that he wanted to keep the essay just as he'd written it because he believed so much in how transformational and how invaluable his Montessori experiences were. Uh, so he went against his advisor's recommendations um, because he said that if a school did not see the value in what he'd said and how that made him the person that he was, that he knew that wasn't the school for him. Um, and he kept his essay the same. He got into his dream school um, and was actually pulled into a, a private meeting with the uh, college entrance um, staff, if you will, the, the board, and uh, commended on how beautiful and how moving his college essay was. So I, you know, I, I think that Montessori is something that's so powerful and s provides such inspiration, not only for us as parents, caregivers, educators, but is also so transformational and so powerful uh, for the children as well. So before I open it up to any final questions, I want to say thank you so much uh, for joining me today. If you come back for a second session or a third or a fourth, thank you so much.